All right, everybody. Thank you all for participating. Uh, my name is Luis Maia, and this is an event promoted by One Health Brazil with lots of partners. So I'm going to pass the word to Cristina. Cristina, good evening, good afternoon, or good morning, depending on where you are in the planet. Yes, so thank you everybody for making the time, everybody's busy agenda, for us to meet and discuss and talk about today our experiences in One Health and also uh, be, a, be, be ready to uh, build uh, partnerships and collaborations and research with a One Health approach. So I'm very grateful to all of you that are here and um, I will introduce everybody as I speak. So right now I would like to share um, my slides so we can uh, introduce everybody. So just be with me here. All right, how are you doing there? Okay, is everything okay, Luis? Hello? Not yet. I'm waiting for your presentation. Okay. Did you We're confirm? Just... Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. You no, no, received... sorry. I thought it was your uh, presentation, but it was Tatiana's coming back. <laughs> okay, this one? Can you see it? Oh, I think you have to start over, okay. share just... in your screen. Okay, we try again. <laughs> <laughs> And we just tried and it was fine. All right. Yes. Let's try again. <laughs> it's always like this. Yes, I got it I here. It. Yeah. So it's All just... right. We, All we right. can see your screen already. Okay, good. All right. So thank you everybody for being here. And this is being um, uh, presented live as well. And I we do have to say uh, good morning, good evening. Good. Uh, some of the you are sleeping already, but we have many guests from all over the world. So I really appreciate, we really appreciate the participation of many countries, many continents, because that is the reason, that's the purpose of One Health. Um, many of you already today, we're not going to discuss all the introduction. We're going direct for to the actions and our experiences, but just a very brief um idea what is the one health one health is from humanity and for humanity so many of the discussions we're going to just talk today it is pretty much we have to change ourselves first to change the world and with the changing ourselves and changing our partnerships and making collaborations and contributing to the world we are helping hum humanity and one of the most important aspects of the concept it is for animal health environmental health human health and plants health when they are all intricately interconnected as you can see there are so many groups of one health all over the world uh, in, in small groups very large groups and we all should be members and participate in all of them the idea is exactly to collaborate one special day is the uh, day of what uh, the one health day which is november 3rd and also uh, many uh, collaborations and partners all around the world as we just after 20 years or more of working together on the 20 cent 19th century and 20th century, as we all know, the One Health came all the way from agriculture, uh, civiliz uh, ancient civilizations. It has a long history, but it is very uh, important for us to have the support of all the world organizations. So in March 17, 2022, the newest, the most updated concept by the quadripartite uh, signed a memorandum of uh, understanding. As you can see, uh, it goes beyond uh, the health, but also the importance of communication, collaboration, coordination, and the capacity building. Uh, all of us, of course, it is, uh, we just don't learn <laughs> one health through the internet, but it's a lot of studies, a lot of work. Many people has been working for the enti their entire lives, even if we didn't call one health before, but I just shared those are the one, those are the books that are 
my bad side so I can also understand and I can also uh, um, understand what is and what is not One Health. So it's very important to know, you understand the concept and also the examples of the approaches. As you can see, it goes all the way from conservation my, uh, medicine to antimicrobial resistance, animals, sentinels, especially now with our pandemics, uh, diseases surveillance, one topic we will be discussing today, emerging infectious diseases, and also topics that many times we don't discuss too much, that it's a one well-being and also um, the environment, uh, environmental health. It is very important, the importance that we have the multidisciplinary uh, aspect and we also call the trans transdisciplinary professional teams involving communities and learning from the communities, especially the um, the culture of each country, the culture of each place. And, and therefore, with this One Health approach, we can have a local, uh, national, international, and a global, global, uh, uh, global uh, approach uh, and impact as well. Uh, we are going to discuss about Latin American today. And as we have a publication with the 20 publications telling different experiences in Latin America, uh, the challenges and success and our experience in Latin America, and especially in Brazil, it came from action first, then to the concept. We're still discussing the concept different than our colleagues from uh, what we call the hemisphere, the north and northern hemisphere. So it's very important that we have all this concept of sharing our experiences, but our, our, um, our um, experience in Latin America the history is described in this uh, article from the approach to the concept with many co-authors and collaborations from different countries sharing exactly how we came from the action to the concept and the whole history that if you're interested to know how, how it, it happened in many countries in Latin America. It is translated in Portuguese and um, public public as well. The, the One Health of Brazil, how did it come up, right? The, just so you know, the uh, One Health, the first One Health One Word Symposium was in Brasilia in 2007 and was hosted by the World Conservation Society from the Bronx Zoo. Then 2009, CDC worked with Leptospirosis in Northeast of Brazil. And then we came, as you can see, there are many pioneers in Brazil and Latin America, and particularly um, in Brazil, we make this network in 2007. So from 2007 to 2022, we're still building and uh, the One Health of Brazil is a network that foster research, education, and collaboration. So as you can see in 2017, uh, the picture on the left is uh, many of us who are uh, participating here today as well. We had, um, uh, uh, what do you call, like uh, uh, names and contacts. And as of today, we have 742 contacts in Brazil, and each is one from the 742 contacts that are the leaders or there are organizers or their participants they also have uh, contacts with other groups uh, small groups of one health so as you can see brazil is uh, many countries in one home country but we have grown and uh, we're very excited that, that uh, as a network we're now preparing for uh, become an association. So stay alert and come to help us to make this come true. Uh, I, of course, we have just go to the One Health of Brazil. All the, it's all volunteers. We all work behind the scenes, pretty much nobody sleeps. And uh, are very diverse groups from nurse, physicians, uh, dentists, and uh, different experiences as well, economy, biology, and, and many other experiences. What do we do? We do a lot of webinars, teaching, and research, especially. One example, we have this overnight uh, group of people uh, talking and preparing, uh, discussing in a small, uh, not a small Zoom, but like a private Zoom overnight that we could discuss the human uh, monkeypox. Also, if you go to the One Health of Brazil, different uh, webinars and different uh, videos. Research the PAT COVID study by the CNPq. It's a multi-centric study. In addition to the One Health of Brazil, I'd like to share also the One Health Latin American and Caribbean, 
which it was uh, supported by uh, the One Health Commission, and we have a we had a meeting in 2017 first, and then 2019 also, and many collaborators came. And uh, there we are co-founders, and now we have over 20 countries that participate, uh, including Caribbean and including, for instance, Cuba. So we have over 20 countries. This is the the network One Health Latin America Ibero Caribbean that has different cultures, different religions, different uh, approaches, and yet we all work together uh, with the same goal. Just this week, we're having the climate change and many groups from different countries meeting in Chile. They are in Patagonia, Chile right now. We also are very proud of One Health of Brazil, One Health Colombia, One Health, uh, any kind of the countries in Latin America, for instance, uh, 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 Professor Dr. Natalia CDL is the representative of Latin America as well. She's one of the members of the OLAP, which is the uh, high level expert panel. Not only that, but we also make importance of the One Health and One Ocean. Sometimes we forget how, of uh, the water, how important it is. And also, since we will be talking today about wildlife diseases, I would like to bring the uh, the uh, become a member also of the Wildlife and Health Alliance organization. As we have different uh, concepts, if you have heard all of us, Eco Health, Planetary Health, One Welfare, and One Health. And it is very important to know all the difference, how they all came about, the whole history, yet remember that pretty much soon or already we're becoming this intergalactic One Health because we're already into the space and how much we have to 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 uh, be worried or be concerned and may take actions to protect, uh, again, the human health, animal health, environmental health, and also the planet. So just so you know, there are differences, yet there are similarities, and it's all one. The idea is to collaborate and not divide in different silos. Today, I have a very, very, um, I'm very, um, uh, I just would like to, it's a very unique, opportunity for us to discuss our, our uh, experiences with uh, uh, Dr. James Wood uh, in, in the University of Cambridge. We also have a very expert One Health panel. Uh, most, uh, they, are prof they are professors in Brazil, different uh, in epidemiology, in uh, disease surveillance, in different in research institutions as well. So as um, as we are going to introduce all, all of them. I do, I do want to uh, welcome Dr. James Wood, who will be our guest speaker today. I just wanted to um, share, and thank you, Dr. James Wood, for being here with us today. He, uh, Dr. Wood has over 20, 20, 20 years of experience of uh, emerging infectious diseases, working globally as well, uh, surveillance animal diseases. He's a veterinarian epidemiologist and also the chair and the dean of the Cambridge Veterinary School. I was very, of course, we always look for, let's see what else I can, since the, everybody's curriculum here will be two hours describing each one of you. I just wanted to share that uh, Professor James Wood was recognized in the Queen's birthday honors. So this is very special for us uh, as well. Uh, I am passing my torch to Dr. Andy Robinson, who will share a little bit about the CABI One Health that is uh, very important for us as researchers to publish and share or work. Thank you very much, all of you, to being here, and all of you are One Health. I'm passing to you the torch, Dr. Andy Robinson. Thank you, Christina. Thank you. Let me just share my screen, if that's okay. Um, is that uh, yes. in full screen mode? Uh, almost. We still have your viewers a screen yeah no worries okay how's yeah, that it is perfect thank you okay. brilliant well thank you christina for for inviting me i won't take time away from uh james's uh, much more interesting presentation 
but I would just like to take the opportunity to talk to you about some one new One Health resources that we have been working at at CABI. And for those of you who may not know who CABI is, uh, CABI is a very interesting organization. I lead the publishing and the knowledge business within CABI, but CABI is also an international development organization that conducts research. We're a not -for international not-for-profit. We're owned by 49 member countries including um, uh, Chile and Colombia. Uh, we have an office in Brazil and we've done a lot of work around plant health, particularly fall armyworm, but also coffee borer uh, in Brazil with uh, our various scientific and development projects. And CABI has been interested in One Health for quite a long time. We published the second edition of Jakob Zinstag's uh, textbook on One Health just recently. Uh, but we also run projects. So our, uh, our flagship project is called PlantWise, and we have helped countries put together a network of about uh, 4,000 plant health clinics with 10,000 trained plant doctors where smallholder farmers bring their sick crops into effectively a mobile clinic and our trained plant doctors diagnose the problem and give them advice so that they can hopefully grow more of their crop. Uh, we're now in the last few years trialing that in a One Health context in Uganda and Kenya, where we're combining uh, plant health clinics with livestock clinics, where we can actually bring together plant doctors, but also uh, vets to be able to dispense that information to smallholders who quite often have crops and livestock. So our interest in One Health has been substantial. Uh, Dr. Robinson, sorry to interrupt yeah. you. Uh, we still have your first slide. I don't know, you're probably passing some slides already. No, I'm just about to move to the second one. Very good. Oh, <laughs> I'm terribly sorry. <laughs> no worries. Um, so we, uh, I first met Christina about 12 months ago when we began researching whether there might be scope for providing more additional uh, publishing resources for the One Health community because it was clear that One Health is a growing subject area. And having talked to Christina and a number of other leading global experts, uh, we found that there might be an opportunity for a new One Health journal uh, because a lot of the journals are, are, are very strong and very good, but they don't necessarily include all of the subject areas, including plant health, environmental health, and most importantly, the social sciences. Um, so we've been developing that, and I'll talk, tell you more about that. Uh, we also found that the number of master's courses uh, on One Health was growing substantially and that there might be an opportunity to develop a case database of examples of how One Health has been used in practice. And so uh, we're now putting together the One Health Cases product. And then finally, there is a lot of literature around One Health because it is so multidisciplinary it's very difficult to get a full view of the whole subject. And there's also a lot of gray literature that is unpublished in journals. So the idea of the knowledge bank is to bring all of that together into a single product to enable people to see across the whole subject. In terms of our vision for One Health, I think a couple of things to stress um, Jakob Zinstag and Lisa Crump and the editorial board are very strong that we don't just want to do m more Me Too type uh, products. So uh, the, the two areas of differentiation are really around the fact that our definition for One Health really focuses on the added value of a One Health approach. So it's not just good enough to say, hey, we went off and looked at how humans and plants interact or how vets and uh, human uh, health people. It's it's very much about what was the added value above and beyond the disciplines working independently. And the other area that we're very, very keen on is around this notion of transdisciplinarity. So it's not just multidisciplinary teams or interdisciplinary teams. It's going the step beyond that where researchers have to engage with society. They have to engage with local and indigenous knowledge in the research process because that we believe will have the best impact of making a transformational change. The resources are edited, as I mentioned, by Jakob Zinstag and Lisa Crump, but we also now have a global editorial board of 40 people. We're aiming for a 50-50 gender balance, and we're pretty much spot on that. 
And right now, I'm afraid we still have a slight bias toward animal science, but we're also trying very hard to ensure that we cover off the areas of social science, uh, human medicine and health, eco and environmental health, but also plant health, where we have some work to do. The journal, as I mentioned, is now open for business, so you can now submit your articles to Cabby One Health. Uh, it is an open access journal. Uh, we are waiving the article publication charge in 2022, and so there'll be no fee for submissions. Uh, we have a broad range of article types, uh, and we'd love to hear from you uh, if you have interesting research that you'd like to be sharing. Uh, the One Health Cases product is also now live. And as I say, I just want to stress, these are not just case reports, as in medical case reports or veterinary case reports. We're trying to put together educationally focused case reports that can be used in teaching. So these should be uh, aids to help uh, lecturers get the, the issues across to their students. And it should also be a useful case study for students to use when looking at putting together project proposals. So these are not uh, interesting and novel cases. These are, edu uh, these are cases with a very strong educational focus, summarizing learning outcomes. Uh, and they have to uh, very much uh, include that value added and that transdisciplinary approach to One Health. So uh, we are very keen to hear from people who have uh, good case studies to publish. Um, and if you'd like to do that, then there is a case proposal form uh, at the URL on this slide. Uh, and you can be in touch with Lisa Crump to talk about whether or not your, uh, your case study might fit the bill. Uh, and then finally, if you want to find out more information about all of our One Health resources, then here is a link. Uh, and we would love to hear from you. And if you have any questions, please do not hesitate to contact me at CABI. My email address is a.robinson at cabby.org. And thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much, Dr. Robinson. And also, it's, uh, you also are U, uh, University of Cambridge. You did your PhD in uh, plants in there. So uh, this is very good that we can, maybe you can pass the torch to Dr. Wood, please. Dr. Wood. Christina, uh, thank you very much indeed. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here virtually. Of course, it would be a far greater pleasure if we could all be in the same room together. But uh, I think it's not just the pandemic. I mean, the, the, the size of Brazil is so great that I think that that, that in itself would create a huge challenge in terms of um, us talking together as if we were in the same room like this. So. Um, Christina and the, uh, the Brazil One Health Group, I, I'm really grateful for the invitation to come and talk to you today. Um, I want to talk about some of the, uh, the work that we've been uh, doing um, on emerging infectious diseases over the last few years and use both um, some of the results from that, but also uh, some publicly available information on uh, the current pandemic, I think, to illustrate some of the points that I want to make um, in relation to uh, what we should do to try and address some of the controls of, um, uh, of infectious diseases. So uh, this is now taking up my whole screen, so I can't see you. So please do talk back to me if there's any problem. Um, I can't see any text or anything. So you'll just have to interrupt me verbally, Christina, if this um, if this isn't working. This is perfect. Yes, it's uh, okay. So you're it. <laughs> thank, you very, thank you very much. Uh, so I, I, I'm going to start off by telling you a lot of things which I think that you probably all know already, but I think it's important sometimes to run over. Um, run over why zoonoses are important because it's easy to forget this sometimes and I think um, to, to start with it's critical that um, there are different studies that come up with with slightly different results but actually the overall the, the, the it's it, overall it's clear that human infectious diseases um, the majority of them um, by far have zoonotic origins I, they come from animals and these uh, th this includes not just viruses but also um, all forms of bacteria, uh, pro, uh, protozoa, um, fungi, and indeed, uh, a, a, a bit a smaller number, but some helminths as well. 
And I think that emerging infectious diseases are more likely to be zoonotic. Um, and a very large proportion of those have a wildlife source. Um, and so what I'm going to do, um, you won't be surprised with this introduction, is to talk quite a lot about um, surveillance of wildlife diseases, um, and in particular diseases that may pay, pose a threat to humans, um, and what we might do to, to reduce some of those threats. It's not that, um, that agricultural species aren't also important, they are indeed, but sometimes there's a bridge between wildlife and humans um, as intermediate hosts, but I'm um, my focus will be more on uh, thinking about wildlife disease um, in terms of the emerging diseases I'll, I'll be thinking about. So again, this is uh, some more old data that I'm sure you have all seen. And this is a, a, a map which is not perfect, but I think illustrates the fact that um, disease emergence from wildlife, um, just as it is from, from uh, livestock, farmed livestock, is very patchy. It's uh, the, the risks are very different in different parts of the world. Um, the map looks different for livestock, but nonetheless is, is very patchy. Um, and I think it's sensible to think about um, uh, focusing on understanding uh, what is going on in some of the areas which appear to have some of the highest intensity of disease emergence. So these are the pathogens that we have known, but it's pretty clear from the relatively poor state of surveillance and understanding of pathogens um, that are carried by wildlife that, that are somewhere between one to two million pathogens yet to be discovered, some of which could pose a risk to humans and others of which won't, um, at least not a direct risk. Now, when we're thinking about wildlife, we, it's important, I think, and useful to think about human wildlife interfaces. And there are many forms that these interfaces can take. And here I'm illustrating um, an interface between a uh, Ghanaian uh, bat bushmeat hunter um, and the bushmeat that he has uh, caught. So this, uh, these here are, are straw-colored fruit bat or Eidland helven, which are being sold to be eaten. And there are a few things that I think I just would like to illustrate um, around this picture. Firstly, um, these are all fresh. Um, uh, this, uh, the the bat in the, the, the bottom left-hand corner of the, this pile is still alive. If you talk to this uh, bushmeat hunter, he will tell you that he has been bitten on many occasions by these bats. He has close contact with them when they are still alive. Um, you will also notice that his store is the side of a road or the side of a, side of a walkway. Um, and the reason that many people um, will have this kind of interface with with animals in, um, in many parts of the world is because they need to have the interface in order to make a living. And if they're not making a living from it, in many other cases, people will be hunting bushmeat because it is their main source of protein. And this is particularly important for um, many indigenous uh, uh, communities. Um, and it's not just the interface, it's what happens after the interface that matters in terms of disease emergence. So in many cases, we have worked um, on, um, on emergence of diseases, thinking very simply about, um, uh, and I've used the example of bats here, uh, where we need to understand the bat populations and the way that, that uh, viruses or other pathogens live in them. Um, and then we study, we're trying to study spillover um, events, and then these spillover events may be between often agricultural intermediate hosts um, and then transmit into people through this, this virus spillover infection. Um, and then this, these infections will have a variable impact on human health and may or may not transmit more. And this is the traditional um, approach that has been taken to, to study uh, zoonotic diseases um, in people who are closely uh, associated with the animals that, that they, they contact. The reality is, of course, far more complicated. And we need to think very much, and this is building on um, what Andy's just been saying, uh, uh, multidisciplinary approach that, that is far more than just this contact between people and, uh, and uh, animals, wildlife and or agricultural posts. And I think it's terribly important to think about the way that society responds to this, the fact that um, although local people may be those that are directly in contact with, uh, with the wildlife species or, or the, the farm species, but then there are medical frontline um, workers that may be the, those that they um, 
that they work with and, and all of the way that they work is, is actually framed or decided by national and international decision makers. Um, and the sort of policy that we think about um, and how it impacts on it is, is global rather than local. And sometimes we come up with grand global policies um, which, which do not necessarily directly get as far as impacting on people who are, um, who are in contact with the species that carry virus pathogens. So just thinking very much about One Health in, in Action, and, and it's great that there will be a um, more of a panel discussion. Um, so I think you will all be familiar with the fact that um, human rabies almost invariably comes from um, dog bites, and in particular in the global south. There is now very good evidence that, that I'm, again, I'm sure that you're all aware of, that, that if you vaccinate a large proportion of the dogs, and often 60% is taken as the... Um, as the uh, as a target percentage, rabies will disappear from the dog population and often from local uh, terrestrial wildlife, such as in um, in parts of sub-Saharan Africa, from, uh, jackals and other carnivores, um, and that can result in the control of rabies. And so you'd say that then say, well, why haven't we controlled rabies? And that is because our governance of One Health systems is not worked out. And so what happens is you have a funded project for three or five years. Um, rabies can disappear from an area, but it comes back again when that project and its funding cease. And I think our great challenge is sometimes actually to focus on the governance and funding of programs far more on, on what needs to be done. I, I'm not going to talk about antimicrobial resistance, but I think it's really important to remember that we need to take a One Health approach to the global challenge of antimicrobial resistance, which is already an ongoing pandemic. Um, which is going to see a far greater impact than um, many other pandemics that, uh, that we are far more worried about in terms of diseases like SARS-CoV-2, uh, COVID-19 or, or Ebola. So what are our approaches to mitigating future pandemic impacts and where we're thinking more about the more transmissible, rapid um, archetypal pandemics such as uh, COVID-19 or, or and the so-called Spanish flu um, of 1918, 1919. So vaccination, I mean, one of the remarkable things about the current pandemic is the ra rapid development of safe and effective vaccines. Um, in the future, there is a desire to create cross-reactive vaccines against pathogens known to exist in animals that may not have caused a pandemic. Novel pharmaceutical medical treatments will help us um, treat uh, a broad range of different pathogens. Um, and of course, we are going to be um, uh, always having the possibility of implementing non-pharmaceutical measures such as lockdown um, and isolation in the face of emerging infection outbreaks. But if we really want to prevent spread, we need to think about how fast is fast enough, uh, fast enough implementation. And this has been, in fact, modelled going back um, some 15 or so years from now for H5N1 avian influenza outbreaks spreading into humans, um, taking Thailand as a, as a country example by my colleague Neil Ferguson at Imperial College. Um, and it was very challenging to implement the sort of controls that you needed to fast enough and early enough, even with the most optimistic of assumptions. Of course, the real uh, aim of prevention is to prevent the spillover infection event in the first place. Um, and that is very challenging, but should, of course, be uh, an ultimate target. Uh, naturally, um, where one measure may not be quite enough, we should look at combining all approaches um, rather than thinking that we have one silver bullet that will uh, match all possible future pathogens. So some of these measures marked in red here are dependent on us having good prior animal and wildlife surveillance data, and then actually using the data to develop new drug treatments or to develop new cross-reactive vaccines. And I'll come back to some of this in relation to some of the funding issues around that. So we think about a new infection in humans. I think uh, if a new infection transmits well between humans, it has an R0 value greater than one, then it will spread. And that then can lead to a rapid evolution. Um, but for a long time, we've been rather um, uh, 
deficient in the amount of data that we've got in relation to how rapidly pathogens can evolve in, in new species. We see some new examples in, in diseases like avian influenza um, and possibly Ebola, um, and they're rather different. But I think SARS-CoV-2 has given us really um, unparalleled insight into how quickly a pathogen can adapt for greater transmissibility. So if we're thinking about trying to stop a, a transmitting pathogen, um, we've got to think about intervening really effectively and rapidly at source. Um, but with a rapidly transmitting pathogen, there are real questions about our ability to, to, um, to uh, respond rapidly enough. So thinking about evolution of, of SARS-CoV-2, I think what you, what you will be aware of, and this is just data from the Republic of, of South Africa, um, this demonstrates that that within um, we've seen or that in South Africa they've seen repeated waves of, of um, SARS-CoV-2 um, every perhaps three to six months um, for the last two years um, and this is what can happen where you have a, a pathogen that is transmitting very widely because it gives such opportunity for uh, for evolution for new variants that are better at transmitting against the immunity seen in the populations that, that it's that are being challenged by it. And this is another way of representing it and how it's been represented in many different countries. So we've been thinking about this for a long time. And in fact, it's nearly 20 years since, um, since a few of us worked with Brian Grenfell to publish the first phylodynamics paper, where we were talking about how um, some pathogens would find it easier or harder to um, create the changes or, or, or to evolve um, into the changes that, that were needed to, to uh, see better transmission in new species. And some key questions that we had that I used in a, a talk um, back in 2009 were why has um, uh, MERS not, not adapted like SARS-CoV-2? Why did the West Africa Ebola outbreak not persist? And what happened with 2009 swine flu? And I think it's really interesting to think about this in relation to um, to uh, virus adaptation and evolution. So MERS is not a dissimilar virus to SARS-CoV-2, but we haven't seen the extent of the evolution. And I think a very simple explanation for that is transmission has never been seen on the scale of SARS-CoV-2, which gives it far, far um, smaller opportunities for evolving because you need to see a lot of transmission in order to give a lot of um, uh, infection cycles, which are the unit of, um, that, that uh, an evolving virus uses to adapt in. The West Africa Ebola um, outbreak, and I'll come back to some of the data from this, but uh, it's clear that, again, transmission was limited, um, uh, again, actually, like, like MERS, by non-pharmaceutical measures, which were sufficient in the face of a value with um, with actually a, a static, R, a pretty static R0 value um, in the case of, of, of Ebola. Let's contrast that with what happened with the 2009 so-called swine flu pandemic. Well, that is, that is now, of course, a global seasonal influenza virus, um, adapting and, and, and uh, reassorting with other, um, other seasonal influenza viruses now. And the reason that I think that we see that difference between that virus and Ebola and MERS is because when it first emerged in humans, it was already transmitting rapidly. And uh, I, I think uh, the measures that were first taken um, were predictably ineffective in the face of a, a, a pathogen that was that, um, that transmissible. We were just lucky that it wasn't so, uh, so pathogenic. So then, given that, can we detect and intervene effectively at source? Well, we can intervene effectively at source with a pathogen that doesn't, doesn't transmit very well. But I think that we actually probably cannot intervene effectively at source with a pathogen that already has a relatively good transmission potential. So then, what well, we're thinking about the different pathogens that, that we may be um, uh, facing in the future. Uh, we need to think about what sort of pathogens um, that, 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 that we're facing and also um, what, what, how, how might, might we detect them if they transmit into, um, into humans. And a key defence and the purpose of all high quality um, infectious disease surveillance programmes is early detection. If you can intervene when the case numbers are very small, it's far easier than if you have a 
a, a situation where there are many cases already, particularly if they're geographically dis distributed. So early detection needs surveillance, and that needs primary health care, laboratory ca capacity, and access of that primary health care to the laboratory capacity. It's not sufficient if it's sitting in a, an inaccessible, uh, uh, well-resourced laboratory in a capital city if primary health care facilities are, um, are not accessing or therefore able to, to, um, to get samples um, from patients there rapidly. And of course, all of that will not work without good communications. That's quite challenging in many parts of the world which were flavored, which were marked as red on that map, where we know that there is under-resourcing in, in many of the low and middle income countries that, that had a lot of red in them. So one other approach is to sequence lots of pathogens from lots of people who are in contact with animals to try and um, early detect uh, any, any pathogens there. So that's one approach. Or maybe we should focus on pathogens within wildlife and then try and develop uh, uh, develop vaccines against all of those different pathogen groups that are found in all of those different species of, of wildlife. But one of the huge challenges is predicting which infections will spill over into humans. And we've been looking to predict for one of the best known pathogens of humans um, what we're going to see next season. And I would just point out the prediction of future seasonal endemic influenza viruses is reasonably good, but frequently inaccurate. Um, and that is for a virus that we understand very well, where we have amazing surveillance data from all around the world. And even then, we're not very good at predicting what we'll see next year. So if we want to think about uh, disease surveillance in low and middle income countries, I'm just going to refer to a study that my colleague Freya Jeffcott, um, Dr. Freya Jeffcott, undertook a few years ago looking at human health seeking behaviors in Brahmahatha region in Ghana. Um, she conducted a five month ethnographic study and compa compared health seeking behaviors of uh, families that she worked very closely with um, in living in both villages and in towns where there were very different patterns of healthcare usage, which had all of the typical socioeconomic drivers of income or constraints of income, the signs of the disease and how, how severe it was. So even um, in uh, the, the, this area of, of central Ghana, which um, isn't well resourced, but has some of the better primary health care of sub-Saharan Africa, she found a lack of, uh, of good record keeping clinics, um, a failure often to refer to records that when they had been kept, the rather challenging communication between um, trained doctors and their patients. There's a lot of malaria in this region. When patients then present with fever, Frequently, they will get treated and then retreated uh, with malaria. Really, the only diagnostic tests available are for malaria. Um, and with, uh, within this system, I think it's fair to say there was really little or no chance of, of um, early detection of emerging infectious diseases. And the only thing that might trigger an, an outbreak investigation was transmission of disease, where you saw clusters of novel cases. And then it can take several weeks for um, those investigations really to kick in, given the resources available, even in a, in a, in a great country like Ghana. So that, I now want to look at, uh, move on to another study that another colleague of mine, um, Dr. Emma Glennon, undertook, looking at Ebola surveillance data, thinking about using this for a well-recognized disease, but so use this as an example for detecting a novel disease at a human-animal interface. So Ebola is well-reported. It's a disease of international concern. We should be able to predict, we can predict how big outbreaks should be or how big the, uh, what the distribution should be given how transmissible um, the infection is known to be in outbreaks. Um, and uh, Emma used the data from the West African um, uh, Ebola epidemic to predict how big outbreaks um, should be given um, given how transmissible the infection was in West Africa. Now she also did this in different parts of that um, epidemic, but I just wanted you to focus on the green marks here. And so this uh, graph in the bottom left demonstrates the number of outbreaks of data the data that she was able to use um, individual uh, transmission clusters. Um, and you can see that, that there is a good number here um, of, um, of uh, cases of, uh, of clusters of all sizes or just single cases. 
Um, and then this, this graph on the top left illustrates how much each case transmitted. And from that, focusing on all of the West African data, which is graph C, um, what she uh, was able to predict is, is the, using the graph um, uh, in green, um, that actually the vast majority of outbreaks should be small because this is not a highly transmissible pathogen, relatively speaking. And actually what she found um, using the hatched black line was the likelihood of, of you detecting outbreaks of different sizes varied massively. And really, in order to have a good probability of detecting an outbreak of Ebola, there needed to be somewhere between, um, uh, somewhere above five or so cases. So the only reason, um, and I'm not the only reason, but the main reason why Ebola gets detected is when it transmits between people. So the summary there is that at least half of all infection spillover events from animals to humans have failed to be detected and reported since the Ebola was first recognized. And the probability of, of detecting outbreaks before they transmit, either ones that are just single cases, is probably somewhere less than 10%. Now, I think that's strong evidence for the need to invest in far more in primary health care if we want to prevent uh, pandemics at source in low and middle income countries. So I think if we're thinking then back, get, taking a step back and going back to the bigger question and looking at transmission in humans, I do not think that intervention at source is likely at the moment to be effective for acute infections with a, an R0 value much over one. So logic therefore is that we must intervene to prevent spillover transmission. And I'll come onto that in a, a little bit more detail. Before I do that, I just wanna talk about the, the, the role of wildlife farming because often, we talk about agricultural hosts being intermediates between um, between animals and uh, wildlife and and, and humans, um, but actually the uh, the reality is that wildlife farming um, can be a very important source of infection or route of infection from wildlife into um, into humans. Uh, let me remind you again that I'm sure that that you um, that you know already that. Farming and the trade of live palm civets was responsible in 2003 for the repeated spillovers into human humans of the SARS-CoV-1 outbreaks. There was an extended epidemic of that infection in traded palm civets, causing multiple spillover events. And it was only when that trade stopped that the spillover events themselves stopped. SARS-CoV-1 almost certainly came from horseshoe bats, as SARS-CoV-2 probably did as well with the palm civet acting as, a, as the key uh, multiplying intermediate host. I'm not sure that we will ever know what the role of farmed wildlife was in the emergence of SARS-CoV-2, um, but it was uh, farm wildlife were commonly sold in the Hunan sea seafood market in Wuhan, um, and they were sold in large numbers, including many species that we now know to, be, to have been highly susceptible to SARS-CoV-2 infection. And so at one level, this is not that different to more conventional agriculture, but it does frequently get uh, disregarded in, in discussions. And there is a massive scale of wildlife farming, um, in particular in South Asia. That's not to say that um, large scale agriculture and movement of animals is still not a massive risk, but I think we need to think of not just about traditional agricultural species. So let's go and sequence every pathogen in every species of, of wildlife. And of course, that would be useful information to know. It would help us to frame the challenge of, of pan future pandemics, but it will be on such a scale. I'm not sure we'd really know what to do with all of the information. I would challenge anyone who says that this is the route to Nirvana in terms of, of pandemic prevention because of the fact that we cannot even pre predict the next seasonal influenza strain when we know what we're starting with and we know um, that it just needs to evolve a little bit into the next uh, seasonal strain. It may be in the future with current technologies or future technologies that we can develop multiple cross-reactive cross vaccines. We could stockpile them or stockpile seed, um, vac vaccine seeds that are ready to ramp up into, into transmission or with RNA um, vaccines that, that may not even be necessary. But who's gonna pay for this? It's actually very difficult to get people to, um, uh, the pharmaceutical industry is most unlikely to pay for this 
without a clear market um, into which it's going to sell its um, any products that it produces. So I think that that uh, whilst uh, investigation of pathogens in wildlife is, is of scientific interest, I'm not clear that it will result in in far better pandemic prevention. So then just to think about some conclusions before I end up with some, some um, further thoughts, we must continue to focus on post-op pandemic responses. So we need to think about non-pharmaceutical measures, the ability to create vaccines very rapidly, as we've done over the last three years, all of the measures, and how we can um, minimise the societal disruption that future pandemics um, occur. In the context of zoonoses, it's obviously really important to think about spillback risks and um, there are three species where, where um, spillover, spillback, um, and then transmission probably back into humans has, um, has occurred. It's certainly with hamsters and with mink. Um, hamsters in Hong Kong, mink in, in at least many European countries and, and likely in, in other parts of the world as well. And repeated incursions of SARS-CoV-2 into white-tailed deer in North America and, and probably some back again. Um, but not such clear um, information about them transmitting back again from the deal, but certainly there's potential there. We must look to improve our early detection of pandemics. Um, we might have a technological solution to that, but without global investment in, in global primary health care, it's going to be somewhat pointless. I think that one of the key things that we must do is reduce spillover infection risk. And I'll come on to what I mean by deep prevention um, in the future. But all of this uh, stuff is polit politically challenging. It's far, far easier for a politician to say, we have a technical solution to this. We will make new vaccines. And I think it's been um, uh, the longer term uh, prevention of spillover infection risk is something that, that needs far more thought and funding um, put into it um, if we're going to make the world a safer space. So by deep prevention of pandemics, and this is what I think we need to be thinking of, I think it's really important to think about how we, we humans interact with animals and the environment. I think there's very clear evidence that biodiversity loss massively increases the risks of pandemic emergence. And this biodiversity loss is caused, caused by industrial scale agriculture, um, and that can be both crop and uh, animal farming. And, and you don't need me in Brazil to tell me that you have your fair share of that with both soya and, and, uh, and beef farming um, in many parts of your, your great country. But massive mining or other extractive industries, I think, are also a huge challenge in, um, in terms of the reduction of, of biodiversity globally. I think it's very important to recognise that humans, and especially indigenous humans, are a, a very important part of biodiversity which frequently, um, who frequently get forgotten and actually are often excluded from um, conversations around biodiversity, which I think is wrong. I think deep prevention of pandemics needs to take care with any movement of live animals and the mixed trade of wildlife species under very suboptimal conditions that is so common in many parts of the world, I think is a particular risk, but we should be aware of any long distance movements of live animals. But I think we need to know more about this and um, more investigation in this area is needed. None of this is going to work without appropriate governance and funding. And I just want to, to, to um, finish by reflecting on some, some uh, discussions that I've had with different people um, in, um, in Ghana. In fact, I had a conversation some years ago with uh, a director of public health in Ghana where we um, some colleagues working with, with Ghanaian wildlife vets said, well, we think we found evidence of Marburg um, and Ebola in some of the bat species in, in your country. And he said, are there any human cases? And we said, well, we don't think so yet. And of course, there have been two Marburg cases now confirmed in Ghana in the last few weeks. And he said, well, that's very interesting and, and quite important. But you have to remember that I have to deal with massive disease burden without enough resource. Um, with diseases that we know about of humans, such as TB, um, HIV, and malaria. Um, and I think we need to think very carefully about how we should be supporting public health measures to try and prevent pandemics. Because I think for countries 
in um, uh, disease hotspots or low and middle income countries, pandemic preventive measures are actually of global benefit and, uh, and actually can interfere with really important public health measures in some of these countries. And so we need to think about responsibilities. And so then that straight away then poses a challenge that we need to think about global governance systems that avoids colonialism in emerging infectious disease research and, and response. I think we need to get away from the idea that we parachute people from a very well-funded uh, global lab in spacesuits into a part of the country um, and leave uh, public health resources, primary health care resources under provisioned in some of those countries. I do think it's really important that we put, uh, that, that we as a global community work to reduce spillover infection risk. Um, and a, a very important part of that is reducing biodiversity loss and on the animal side, target the live animal trade. Um, and I think there are good welfare reasons to justify targeting that trade, as well as the, uh, the, the issues around pandemic. And I think that we need to increasingly to, to challenge the extractive industries that, that um, are such a challenge, uh, such a, a, a great damage to, to biodiversity globally. This, of course, then becomes very political and very politically challenging. And that is one reason why these really uh, difficult measures are largely ignored. All of this put together, I think, is a is, um, very strong scientific need for a pandemic instrument. But I don't think, uh, I think a pandemic instrument on its own is not going to be su sufficient without um, really clear global governance systems around that pandemic instrument and resourcing properly. It's not enough to, to use the um, international health regulations of the WHO to say, well, you need a surveillance system that's going to enable you to detect um, detect a new virus um, in, in your people and then do something about it We're, with full knowledge um, that actually the resourcing in many countries is not enough to allow both rapid detection nor um, rapid response. And I think we need to take this challenge up as a global One Health community. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Wood. And I think it's uh, fantastic that you brought very important challenges that we have as uh, global health, public health, one health, eco health, uh, planetary health, <laughs> integrated health, right, Dr. Robinson, that we have been discussing a lot. Um, so I think it, you, you brought uh, very important points. And it, I would just do a little bit improvising here, but I would like just so we just before we start our panel with our experts, um, I, uh, I just want to share one moment to start um, <clears throat> the discussion. And can, can all of you see this paper, this article? Yes, we, we can. Yes. Uh, so as um, I was just reading also yesterday, this very amazing article that you published uh, together with uh, Dr. Peter Daszak and Dr. Andrew Kunikan, coming also, as you can see, from the zoological aspect, the conservation medicine, but also from the Echo Health Alliances. So as we call the integrated health, uh, which is one health, or we can have another discussion about that. But it's very important. One thing that um, I wanted to start our uh, forum discussion as you can see exactly what you just mentioned. Almost two decades later, the situation has not changed. And despite improved knowledge of the underlying causes, little has been done at the policy level to address these threats. For the sake of public health and well being, humankind needs to work better to conserve nature and preserve the ecosystem services, including disease regulation that biodiversity provides while also understanding and mitigating activities which lead to disease emergency. 
We consider that holistic One Health approaches to the management and mitigation of the risks of emerging infectious diseases have the greatest chances of success. So I like this article very much because, of course, it brings the One Health emerging infectious diseases and wildlife in two decades of progress. So I start our uh, deb debate, as I mentioned, um, let me just stop sharing here, as I mentioned, like, Decades later, we're still on the same step. And that's why it's very important to maintaining the solid, um, sustainable collaborations and partnerships between other research institutions and universities, because we're still in need to continue this, um, this goal. And I, I just wanted to then bring our panel from... Uh, that are all here. Uh, Dr. Juliana, I, I'll pass to you the moderation. So please, you can introduce all the others and we can start with the debate. Uh, just like 20 years later and uh, we have much to be done. Oh yes, so much to be done, Dr. Christina. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. James. Thank you, Dr. Andy. I guess we have so much to work together. And uh, I don't know if some of our friends here have some questions for Dr. James or Dr. Andy. Jane, Tassiana, Professor Dolorata, any questions? Let me turn on your microphone, please. Okay, hey, okay. I have one question. Um, Jane, just introduce yourself, please. Professor Dr. Jane McGitt is uh, one of the pioneers also in Brazil for One Health. So just a little bit of your background, please. Okay, so I'm a professor of infectious disease at the veterinary school, UNESP in Botucatu. I've been working with infectious disease for longer and my subject, my, in fact, I, I work too much, more with rabies, but also brucellosis. And now we are studying more about uh, One Health and trying to do research involving the One Health concept. And in fact, what you have presented is, we can, we can say that is challenging because I can't see in this moment one situation where we can get the government and also the universities and a, a good surveillance system. So my question is, what do you think that, uh, how we can involve the private, the private companies together with the governments for getting better results in surveillance? Is it possible to have this in Africa or in other countries? What do you think about this? I think that's a really interesting and very difficult question, Jane. And you know it's difficult, I think. Um, I mean, my my view is that that uh, that this is something that really, ideally, we should be thinking about um, doing from a, a central public health perspective. Um, my observations of one quite large private company that has involved itself in in surveillance and, and um, pathogen surveillance in wildlife, um, without naming any names, and there may be more than one, um, so I hope I'm not going to identify it, is that they have worked in a very colonial way. They've extracted samples, working with local people, and generally provided no data back to those people. There's been no follow up with those people. Um, and then they have sold the data, mostly to insurance companies, to try and um, help the insurance companies uh, quantify the risk of pandemic or disease emergence in different areas. Or it's been a benefit for the uh, um, for militaries um, that want to know about what pathogens they might need to worry about if their soldiers were ever to be sent to some of those countries, which probably narrows down the number of countries that you might imagine the country the company is based in. Um, 
so I, I think that the, the involvement of the private sector is really challenging in this respect. I know that private sector can often be more efficient than cumbersome public health authorities. And so maybe if there are specific tasks to be done, then using private, um, uh, using um, uh, industry to, to do this rather than relying on, on sometimes kind of slow public health or university systems might might be preferable but i think that that's that should be quite limited and constrained and should always be for the benefit of of the local and national people and not just for people to make profit out of which i think is where some of the problems comes uh, some of the problems come and, uh, and i think it can be very distorting in terms of actually helping to address public health threats um, rather than necessarily being a help so i think it's a really difficult really good question but i think it's a really difficult one it's an idea word, right? But I, but I think that using private industry to do things more efficiently can be a really good thing. But I think um, this is what you know. That then, you, if you're looking at who's paying for it, and if it's um, uh, international, national public health authorities, then, then trying to make sure that they limit um, the exploitation of those data um, to make sure they're properly shared through open access type agreements, I think, is really important. Thank you, Dr. James. Yeah. Uh, Dr. James. Oh, I'm sorry, Chris. No, yeah. I was just going to share. What, what is your experience in Brazil, Dr. Majid? Is it the same? We're still having issues on having the disease surveillance? Uh, in fact, I personally, I don't work too much with surveillance because, because I work more in pathogenesis. But uh, looking at our country, it's very difficult to consider that we have a good situation, we have a good surveillance. We know that we have some um, local, local actions, but not... Uh, a wild involvement, so I can't say too much about that. Go, go ahead, Dr. Juliana Galera. Sorry, it was just like, it was just to share you what is the, because usually what we hear is uh, all over the world. It's not only a problem in Brazil. So I think we're having this issue all over in this, uh, the world. Go ahead, you. Uh, actually, I, I just wanted to say that here in Brazil, we are facing, I guess, some of the worst moments in disease surveillance. Well, we know we have diseases around us. And actually, here in Brazil, we don't close our doors ever. <laughs> so we, we are accepting all the diseases in this world, and it's a problem. And, and I guess, uh, well, it's not only a political problem. It's also financial and also team and also research and learning and the, the, the meaning of science here in this country. Well, actually, we have a lot to, to work as a one health people together, but, but we have to start the basic. The basic is, is lacking knowledge, is lacking financial, is lacking politics and everything. I'm sorry, I, I needed just to speak about Brazil. <laughs> uh, but but unfortunately, we are, we are facing very, very difficult problems, not only financial. I don't know if there is anybody who wants to make some questions. Adolorata, Tassiana. Would you like to speak in Portuguese? Then I may translate or Chris. Vocês querem falar em português? A gente pode traduzir? Tira o microfone. Você quer traduzir, Cris? Would no, you like to translate? Just... No, you, you can go. Ok. Posso falar? Yes, you may. I'll just try to translate to you, Dr. James and Dr. Andy. Just introduce Dr. Professor Adolorata. She's oui. from University of Jabuticabal, also works with epidemiology studies. Go ahead. Go ahead, you. 
Thank you, Dr. James Wood, Dr. Andy. Um, uh, we have him happy, very happy, um, your uh, participation in this uh, panel. Thank you. I don't speak English very well, nem, nem muito, nem pouco, nem nada. Bom, é, a minha, eu gostaria de fazer uma pergunta com relação, exatamente pela experiência é, do Dr. James em ações né, na África em, ou em países, né, e, e mais especificamente relacionado à raiva. A Aliança Global para o Controle da Raiva estabeleceu uma meta né, para... É, 2030, é, acabar com a raiva humana transmitida por cão. Nós já estamos em 2022. É, tanto o doutor James como o doutor Andy consideram essa é, meta ainda possível, exatamente baseado na experiência que eles estão tendo nesses países onde a incidência da raiva humana por cães ainda é muito alta. Dr. James and Dr. Andy, Professor Adolorada is talking about the Global Alliance for Rabies Control and she's she has mentioned about the 2030 goal. Well, where we should when we should stop finally dog rabies, human rabies due to dog biting. Do you think, do, do you both think, Dr. James and Dr. Andy, is it possible to reach this goal? What we should do to improve it all, considering your experience and your global view? Andy, do you want to go first? Uh, I think it's fair to say I'm not an expert on this topic, so I'll let you take it, if that's okay. Professor Adorato, thank you very much for your question. I, I think we know that rabies can be controlled by 2030. We understand how to do it. We know what measures need to be taken. Humanity can do this. And I think that, that one of the challenges is, is that we spend so much money in our departments of health globally on post-rabies prophylaxis. And if some of that were invested in dog, dog rabies vaccination through a One Health governance, then we remove the need to spend that money. We will never completely remove rabies from uh, as a risk. Um, and you will know in, in Brazil, though, better than me, that there are particular challenges with, with bat rabies you know, with other forms of wildlife rabies, but I think you know bat rabies is one of the most obvious ones that will not be controlled by by dog vaccination. But that is a very small cause of human disease, um, albeit you know different in some regions. I think you probably have more more challenges in in Brazil than probably in nearly any other country around the world. But I think that that is still a small proportion of the total cases of rabies that occur anywhere. Um, And I, I think that, that if we can improve the governance, maybe we need best business models for how we look at this. You know, what is the cost effectiveness of One Health? We're always just saying, give us money into this sector without actually sitting down and, and saying that the, uh, if we do this, then we make a saving. People often, you know, we, we don't publish papers on that. We just publish conceptually. And I think sometimes we need to think about what politicians and their economic advisors think about, not just the way that we think about disease. So I think there is massive opportunity because we know we can do it, but we, might, we need to change the governance. So we make um, the, the problem in dogs, not just a problem for an agriculture department, or a, it needs to be a problem that is shared between an animal ministry And that those obviously are different, whether they're agriculture, depending on which country you're in, and the ministries of health, the departments of health in our countries. And at the moment, this One Health 
uh, system is not governed um, sh jointly between between government uh, departments in the way that I think it should be, and we all, we probably all recognise it should be. So I think there's opportunity here, and I hope the pandemic and the pandemic instrument, which talks about One Health, can be a catalyst for change. Let, let us hope. But, but I think we can do it, um, but we need, to, I think, to take a somewhat different approach to what we've done in the past. Timely dog. That's One Health we respect you. It's interesting, uh, all of us here, but I think it's in interesting, maybe one of you can share, uh, Professor Gallardo, the, the, there are currently cases of rabies in humans in Brazil, and it's very important. So if you just wanted to share how, like, we're still in need of more work, not only at national level, but local level, that interferes all over the world. Do you want just to share, uh, Dr. Jane Magid and uh, Gallardo, what is going on with the rabies in Brazil? Because I know well, there's an indigenous population being involved as well, bringing the politics here. Yeah, by now we, we have uh, four human cases, three human cases, deaths, already dead, and uh, they, are, they were indigenous people from Minas Gerais state. Due that rabies cases, those rabies cases were due to bat bite. So unfortunately, we have some how to say hematophagy, hematophagic. How to say? I don't know. Christina, please help me. Hematophagy. Hmm. <laughs> uh, it. I forgot the name of the species of the. I'll say that. There's not uh, rotundus. There's not rotundus mainly. And uh, unfortunately, we, we still have some cycles of this kind of rabies transmission. It's much more common in ruminants, but unfortunately, sometimes people get in this problem. And we have another case. The person is still hospitalized and it's due to cat, but uh, a secondary transmission. It was due to bat and then the cat became infected and then the cat infected the person. So unfortunately here in Brazil we have lots of cycles and sometimes people don't have access to post-exposure prophylaxis. And, and, and that's the, the problem I, uh, I meant when I told we have to work in surveillance, disease surveillance, they're the basic part. Some people just don't have not, not always we don't have to give them, but these people don't know, don't even know that they need some, some help or they need to face some medical issues, something like this. And that's the scenario in whole Brazil. I guess in this context, we need to consider also the cultural aspect because people don't know about the disease. It's not just a, a Brazilian problem, but we have this in a lot of other countries like in Indian and, and others. It's complicated. I think that's exactly right. Um, the, 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 and the cultural um, reticence of seeking immediate medical care after recognized bites, I think is, is a huge problem in India and many countries in sub-Saharan Africa too, where you'll go to a traditional healer. And I think one of the greatest challenges is the fact that there's so much that can be done in terms of prevention by immediate washing of a bite wound, with a particular soap or detergent. It's so effective um, and that is often um, disregarded. You know, the wounds are bound up tightly instead of being, you know, openly washed um, to try and remove and uh, disinfect the any virus that may be persistent there. Um, but, but I think that the, the challenges that you have with, with um, vampire bat rabies are, they're not unique to Brazil, but they are they're far greater than the global challenge, which is driven so much by, in terms of numbers, by, the, by rabid, uh, rabies in dogs. And I think that the challenge that you have, have there is, is greater. And I, but my understanding, and I'd be very interested in your reactions, is, is that because as you say, um, vampire bats feed so effectively off cattle, ruminants in particular, that often, in, often it's the um, deforestation and uh, 
and large cattle ranches, cattle farms that actually then promote larger populations of vampire bats, which then pose a, a, a further risk to some of the people, indigenous or, or farmers um, that may be living in those areas. And again, this is, I think, another example of, of where I, I think some of this farming is effectively an extractive industry. Living in those areas. And again, this is, I think, another example of, of where uh, and and I think that that it's an example of where biodiversity loss actually is one of the things that leads to greater spillover infection risk from animals to humans. Thank you. Um, just just a, a, a simple question because uh, coming back to the private private companies. Uh, I saw that was interesting that now we have a, a monkeypox vaccine that is available and we didn't have Ebola vaccine and we didn't have uh, other vaccines that uh, were very, very important. Can I have your opinion about that? So I think one of the huge advantages with monkeypox is, is that there is still a license, there are still um, a small number of licensed smallpox vaccines available. And, I, and my understanding is that the monkeypox vaccine is just a smallpox vaccine, which is known to be very effective against monkeypox. And so this is one that has been sitting on the shelf, as it were, um, for many years, um, which for which there was no development cost because it had been used on such a massive scale with smallpox eradication. We're just lucky that one or two companies still had product that was usable. I think the Ebola vaccine is interesting because there is now a vaccine available that has been in human trials and is used in um, Central, uh, Central Africa in particular um, to try and help, um, help with the control of, of epidemics. And it's got limited licensing in some European countries as well, and Germany is a country I know has been using it. So, so I think we have Ebola vaccines, but I think the problem with them is that there is no market on an ongoing basis. And so a company that develops it then does not receive money in return for that development cost. And I think this is something, if we, we are serious about pandemic prevention, that we need to think about how we resource pharmaceutical measures which are of global importance, such as an Ebola vaccine, potentially. Um, you know, we've seen, uh, we've seen what monkeypox can do when it, um, when it transmits in, um, outside of its um, endemic areas of Central and West Africa with the current, the current uh, disease of international concern, as the WHO has now called the monkeypox um, challenges of, of the moment. And, and I think that we, we've got to think more um, more than just uh, the, the, the market forces will help deliver us the preventions that we need, because I think the evidence is quite clear that the market does not work um, in terms of, of delivering or providing products on the shelf that are needed for, for immediate pandemic responsiveness. And I think it's really, I don't think we have a system for doing it. Doing it. I know that, that, that um, non-profit organizations like Gates Foundation and the Wellcome Trust are thinking about this. But I think we've, we've got to bring governments into this to bring it to, to, to mobilize larger amounts of money rather than, than these quite wealthy organizations, but not wealthy enough to, to fund this sort of measure on a global basis. I bet. But we have, we had, we still, uh, you use it to have monkeypox in Africa. And there are no vaccines at the, uh, that I know. That, that, that I think is a, um, another example of um, it's okay for an African to have, to have disease, but we only worry when it gets into North America or into Europe. And I think that this is, you know, the, the, the acceptance of a, an unacceptable level of disease in some parts of the world that the global community seems to tolerate um, is something that 
in terms of, of disease, global disease prevention is an attitude we must change. I think it's unacceptable and, and really poor practice. Yeah, so we need to think in a global way and not just locally, right? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I, I was just going to share, Jane, uh, uh, exactly how we become with a, a social and economical aspects, how important it is. And again, how we're going to reach all the way to the most rural and disadvantaged populations. Even the vaccination to get towards there, logistically, it is hard as many people are even trying to, to how to get it. So this is a very challenging experience, but we hope that maybe through One Health or through more collaborations, we can help each other at a, it is practically at a local level and developing this uh, sustainable places. And um, I, one question I had, and that's why Dr. Uh, Patricia Daps, uh, Dr. Patricia Daps is a physician who works with, uh, um, with the patients, the human patients, and all these issues, including one of her uh, One Health projects is Hanseniasis, which in Brazil and certain places in the United States is associated with, again, when you mention like we all become scared when it's coming to our backyard, right? <laughs> and then uh, the Hanseniasis is associated with uh, the armadillo, for instance, with the illegal uh, hunting or cultural as well. So that's why, she, but at the same time, she's also here as part of the forum to discuss other emerging infectious diseases. But when we have the um, change on the environmental uh, issues, and I'll just bring one, one discussion that it's one of the persons that has been directly working with the, we had a disaster in Brazil, which was a mine and um and, and also maybe dr uh, patricia Depps can bring that but i'll just bring what the one of the per, the the question is let me see if i can translate that uh, uh what is uh, yeah what what have I been doing in in terms of one health towards the environmental disasters and uh, how can we bring more this multidisciplinary and transdisciplinary to the uh, One Health, especially the diseases that are coming because of environmental disasters? And he's bringing this aspect because of the Brumadinho. It's the worst disaster that happened in, 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 in the world, I think. And I, I think, Patricia, would you like to discuss a little bit that, the disasters, in, including on the mining? Thank you. And feel free to talk about Hanseniasis as well, because <laughs> it's a wildlife trade as well. So. Yeah, well, I'd like to introduce myself to the team. Uh, some of you know me. I'm Patricia Debs, professor at the Federal University of Spirit Santo in the southeast part of Brazil. And I'd like to greet everyone here and the audience and special um, thank you to Professor Wood and Andy Robson for the, to accept the invitation to come and celebrate with us your experiences. Uh, and of course, Christina is always uh, working as a bridge for us on this project of One Health. Yeah, I would like to discuss if Professor Wood or Dr. Uh, Robson would like to, to add uh, the experiences uh, working on mining companies in Africa, perhaps, and uh, lots of biodiversity and the relationship with some emergent disease, emergency disease. Of course, in Brazil, we have this, um, the, this accident or not people here qualify not an accident exactly because it, it seems that had been uh, um have been told about the, the risk um but anyway maybe you have some some experiences um with mining companies in africa and the relationship with emergent disease
uh, James, I think there's one for you. I, I, I can confess, I, I'm not aware of anything that's, uh, that's directly relevant from a cabbie perspective. So, I'm less, so Patricia, you ask both specific and quite a broad question there. Um, and, and I think that, that um, there are examples of, of individual disease outbreaks associated with, with extractive industries such as mining. But I think often those um, where the, the, the mining is um, invasive into things like indigenous territory, some of the greatest disease threats come from diseases like STIs and malaria being carried in by miners into indigenous communities. Um, and not, you know, obviously, if you put human groups together, then uh, there's no need for species jump. The infections are already um, pre-adapted to spread well in, in, in people. And I think some of, the, some of the greatest challenges come there. There are certainly examples um, of, of disease emergence um, around mines um, that in particular relate to bats. Um, and there are examples of, of Marburg and Ebola that are quite well tracked back to mining operations. And, and actually, what, one of the, the um, long before the, um, all of this global interest in coronaviruses, I think it's, it's worthwhile going back to some, some work that was done in um, Hong Kong um, by Malik Pires's group, um, who went and sampled coronaviruses from a single colony of bats uh, with a, had a variety of different species in it and um, very simply they found more um, viral diversity coronavirus diversity in that uh, in, in that single colony than you find in the human whole of the human population and so I, I think that we, we uh, ignore the risks of of the way that extractive industries put in put us um, in contact with wildlife species at our peril and if we continue to exploit the world and um, whether it's by digging holes or um, or uh, working very close to to very damaged ecosystems um, we should expect to have more pandemics every year because we are um, doing what is clearly characterized of putting not just putting people next door to those because actually there are very few parts of the world where people have never lived. But it's in terms of pandemic emergence, what we are doing with these extractive industries is putting people who are in contact with our globalized world. They will there will be some people that are moving backwards and forwards from those regions into big cities, which are all interconnected around the world. So it's not just the generation of infection. It's also then the onward transmission of infection. And beyond that, that is, I think, so uh, the, the, the lethal combination in relation to things like extractive industries. Um, but in terms of the, the wildlife trade, I mean, I think that the, the wildlife trade and, um, and the, the armadillo and Hansen's disease, I mean, this is just another example of, of where, where trade in, in um, sometimes large, l large numbers of, of particular species where we're putting together, we're mixing them, we're, um, we're, we're managing them artificially, unnaturally. Um, that's a perfect space for disease emergence. Um, and the more we do that, and particularly mixing them with other species, we should expect to see more diseases emerging from that. But, I don't think that's a good example answer to all of your question, which was very broad, but hopefully it's addressed some of the points that you raised. Yes, thank you for the, the answer and for your presentation as well, because I remember in your presentation you mentioned this um, mining companies that would cause some loss of biodiversity. And I just wanted to know if there is a direct link with emergence, disease emergence, or is a non direct link. Um, this balance, of, of course, this yeah. is probably the key. The key of, of I think the it can be, but, it, but I think that's a really important question, particularly when we're talking to policymakers. And I think actually, the, the there are direct examples of mining causing disease outbreaks of human disease from animals. Um, but I think that the bigger, longer term risks come from the indirect challenges, which I know are harder to talk to 
to politicians about. But I think that we should be clear that these are the bigger longer term risks. Yeah, and if you were aware about the uh, heavy metal intoxication that coming from the mining company or the extractive, um, yeah. you know, the mining company, there are many steps, of course, that they work in a you know, the bare big trade until the end, but when they work in, you know, extracting and purifying the iron, they use other heavy metals and chemical uh, products, and these, of course, uh, cause contamination in the, the land around uh, where they are. So this is probably spread. Absolutely. I mean, and a very good example of that, I think, um, Patricia, is the, the massive use of arsenic chem chemicals around gold extraction in, in Amazonas, um, yeah. which is catastrophic for the local environment and will have all sorts of then indirect impacts. It's not di just directly on the health of people and animals in the area, but in terms of ongoing um, biodiversity loss. Yeah. That's a Thank you. Thank you. I guess Dr. Tassiana has some question. Tassiana, gostaria de perguntar. Oi, tá ouvindo? Sim, pode falar. Yes, may speak. Eu, eu a, agradeço a oportunidade e a empatia de vocês de poder me comunicar no português e ter alguém para ajudar. É, eu uma pergunta para o Dr. Wood acerca da raiva, né? A, a, a raiva aqui na nossa região, quando eu falo Amazônia, é um agravo muito importante. E nós vimos que mudou o perfil da doença, né? Hoje ela é principalmente aqui transmitida por morcegos, e nós temos várias espécies de morcegos entre hematófagos e não hematófagos. E tanto é que, de uns tempos para cá, esses animais eles têm adoecido muito, muitos morcegos têm sido encontrados doentes, até em área urbana, e por, por alguma doença eles estão morrendo não só por raiva, para vocês terem uma ideia, em um intervalo de um pouco mais de um mês, nós diagnosticamos dois morcegos não hematófagos positivos para raiva em área urbana aqui, na, no centro da cidade. É, e então eu pergunto para o doutor Wood, se ele acredita é, que nós possamos ter um controle é, efetivo da doença em relação a esses animais, já que nós temos um controle, é, tivemos sucesso no controle da raiva transmitida por cão, por gato, embora o risco ainda existe, né? no município de, de Marabá, uma, da área aqui do estado do Pará, nós tivemos um caso positivo em um cavalo, também em área urbana, por variante 3, transmitida por morcego, né? Então, doutor Udi, só acredita que nós conseguiremos um dia ter um êxito no controle da, da doença através do, de, de animais silvestres? Thank you, Tassiana. Dr. James, she's asking about uh, bat rabies. She told us that she lives in the Amazon region here in Brazil very close to to, Ama, to Amazonia. I, I guess you live already in Amazonia, né? Você está na Amazonia, né, Tassiana? Oh, yes, she's already in the Amazon region. And she's telling us about some cases of bat rabies and also human rabies and other animal, ra on animal animals rabies due to bats. And she she's wondering, do you think or do you believe would there be an effective control in bat rabies or some strategies on bat rabies, even insectivorous or hematophagos? Yeah, I, I mean, I, this is an area that I'm not, not expert in. Um, my understanding from colleagues um, that work directly on bat rabies is that uh, it's actually very complicated. Um, and the any interventions directly against the bats um, can be helpful sometimes, but also quite dangerous in terms of dispersing viruses between different bat, bat um, colonies. 
um, because if you if you um, either burn a colony out or or kill some of them, then often the individuals that are remaining and not killed will fly further to to meet with other communities. So if they're carrying, if you do that in the in response to local cases, you know that there is rabies in those bats. You're unlikely to kill them all. You risk spreading it further um, because if rabies is not uh, at a high level in all bat populations all the time. And I think that I'm not sure that we really understand well what the impacts of these interventions are, but but certainly using um, using uh, inefficient killing of wildlife species where you're not killing everything is quite risky. And we have the same problem in this country looking at um, TB in a, um, a mustelid population, in a, in a, a, a terrestrial carnivore, the, the European badger. And it's very, very contested and controversial, even though large amounts of money have been spent trying to understand how to stop those animals in, infecting cattle. And it's, I think that there are no simple answers, but I, I, I wonder where there are population, human populations that are known to be in close contact with, um, or at risk of, of bat rabies, whether it's possible in those situations to promote human rabies vaccination as a way of, of preventing this. Um, because I think that that is something that that, that could be um, could be uh, quite successful, although I don't underestimate the cultural and other challenges of instigating a, a large um, vaccine program. But then sometimes it's easier if people have seen their families or friends die from this disease, um, if it is diagnosed, if, if there is a, a, a demonstrated um, uh, effective prevention. So I, 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 Tatiana, I think that is a really difficult, good question. And thank you very much. But I don't think there's an easy answer to it. If there was, you would know the answer already. I'm... Well, thank you, everybody. This is just the beginning of many opportunities that we ha will have. And I would like to say thank you to all of you, Dr. Wood, uh, Dr. Robinson. You do have lots of to collaborate with us, yes, and you, because especially uh, Dr. Maya, just a place that we will provide workshops how to submit. One aspect that we need to do, one health, it is um, share our ideas, our publications that happen in Brazil and Latin America. And as you can see today, we improvised and we translated each other and we were able to communicate. So we're not going to let the barriers of language to stop us. And also financially, as you can see, we're all volunteers here and we're looking for funding so we can help with the networks to be established as well. And so we have all the aspects and involve, and it has been happening a little bit better in Brazil, the, the public policies as well. So we're working hard. And the idea is again, to get out of our silos and share and make a better humanity because that's the purpose of One Health. So I would like, I know we would like to stay here for longer, but we do respect each other's, everybody have their own responsibilities. Some of them has to go for dinner, others have to go teach, and others have, as I said, we have four different time, uh, different times in here, it's hard. Just being together, I do believe we start a great partnership, a great collaboration, and we will continue. Uh, moving on, including another meetings. So if anybody else would like to share something, say something I would like to just for today to say thank you to all. Thank you to the audience. Many people are not available today because they have conflicts, but these will be, be placed on uh, several websites, including uh, World, uh, the Alliance, uh, International Alliance and Wildlife Trade will be posted in there. So many people will be going, we might meet again for that group and then uh, com uh, continue the discussion. And also for the One Health Commission, One Health Initiative and One Health of Brazil. So the, the, the re recorded video will be available for all. So for now, it's just, this is the beginning of a great uh, opportunity that we have much to share. And one day we will be all sitting together in the same room and continue this. So thank you all very much. If you, anybody, please, uh, Dr. Wood, if you have anything to share, Dr. Uh, Robinson, we do have those workshop coming and we need publications. So your expertise is essential, especially bring the plant 
that that's your point in this, the environment. Uh, Dr. Maya, do you have anything to say? And thank you all of you from the, Brazil, the One Health of Brazil administration to be here. Dr. Maya, would you like to close for us and give us the last uh, I don't know if Dr. Wood or yes. Dr. Robinson would like to say a last word. Andy. I would just to say thank you very much for for uh, for involving Cabby in this really excellent uh, webinar. And thanks to Dr. Wood for uh, a really great talk. Uh, please do uh, consider writing up your practical case studies and submitting your research to our journal. Uh, we're open for business and we would love to spread the good word about the excellent One Health work in Brazil. So thank you very much. And thank you very much for me. It's been fantastic to be um, part of such a great panel and also to talk to such a great audience with really good questions. And um, I'm sorry I'm not in the same room, but it's been fantastic to be here. Thank you very much. Well, uh, I will thank you everybody for participating. This has been a great opportunity for all of us. And I hope to have all of you uh, who have watched this video to uh, subscribe to our channel. We are going to come up with some more announcements and some more opportunities to learn together. Thank you so much. Have a good one. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye.